exactly about a year ago, my uncle died very suddenly from a heart attack. So, um, and this is my uncle on, on the left of the photograph. He was full of life and it was a sudden shock to the system. And um, it was one of those things that, you know, like as you would expect, it uh, questions your mortality. When this happened, then of course, then I realized actually my grandfather also died from a heart attack, which I hadn't sort of completely forgotten um, about 20 years back. So this sort of was, you know, making me a bit worried. So um, then about six months ago, oops, then about six months ago um, on CNN, I saw uh, Dr. Sanjay Gupta having this talk about how South Asian men have a very high risk of heart disease, and it's because of a particular mutation in a particular gene, uh, which they actually discovered only about sort of six years ago. And he had done this gene test, uh, so the, the piece was about that and a link to that. So, uh, so it turns out that this particular um, gene is this MYBPC3. And if you have a mutation in that particular gene, you're actually seven times more likely to die of a heart attack. So it's not just a small variation, but it's, it's a pretty dramatic uh, thing. So the first thing I thought was that I should, you know, I should get one of these gene tests done. But um, so before that, I also looked at you know, what are the risk factors. And um, so obviously weight would be the obvious one to think about. So I looked at, you know, okay, so what is the normal measure that people look for weight and, and with respect to heart disease? So as you probably know, body mass index is the, is the most common uh, measure, which is a kind of equation between so your height and your weight. And my body mass index was absolutely fine. It was completely average. There was nothing to be worried about. But also, as you probably know, this particular index, which actually was, that was first formulated back in the 19th century, so this is not even a 20th century construct, so it's you know, formulated back in the 19th century, um, has a lot of flaws. So the best examples of this particular flaw is probably uh, here, Johnny Wilkinson, uh, the English rugby player um, on the right in his prime, being classified as overweight according to this particular index. And, um, and Brad Pitt, when he was training for the Fight Club, again classified as overweight. So this index isn't perhaps the, the best one to, to use if you're going to try and figure out you know, what is your risk of heart disease. So it turns out that fat, not all fat or not all flab is, is created equal. So it turns out that certain fat uh, at certain parts of your body, and I, the first speaker also alluded to this, is actually more dangerous than, than other places. So it turns out this fat around your tummy, so what is termed as visceral fat, is particularly bad. And the first, first large-scale studies of this were done um, just only about under, under, under sort of six months ago, the first sort of very large-scale study. And it turns out that if you, have, um, if you have this belly fat in this visceral area, you're actually 50% more likely to die out of heart disease, more than if you were obese, for example. Mm -hmm. So, so it turns out that this particular fat is actually a, a really you know, bad thing to have. And people think the mechanism underneath that is that this, uh, the, fat, the metabolism of the fat cells is different in this area and essentially secretes a hormone which actually inhibits uh, the production of insulin or actually interferes with insulin. So then I went, okay, and also there's been some previous studies sort of um, <coughs> looking at that and, and you can add waste as a, as a predictor of, of heart disease. So then I thought, okay, so let's go and do some healthy stuff to try and reduce my belly area, and let's try and monitor this over a time period. So I started swimming, had some better food, um, kicked out all the junk food, and I started, um, and I thought, let's try and monitor your, your measure measurements. But then actually, you know, how do you take these measurements in your, in your waist and your belly area? Because actually, it's not that easy. Because when you take a, a, a tummy like this, where do you actually take it? Where is your waist? And I know this in particular because of my, my day job, if you like, um, which is in, in the area of fashion. And actually, even very experienced tailors 
actually can have vastly different measurements of a particular waist or hips or, or a bust area. So actually, this is not so straightforward. So then it comes to um, what, what I do for, to earn my living, is that I run a company called Bodymetrics, uh, which is in the, well, we have this thing uh, in, um, in Bloomingdale's in, in the Stanford Mall, which, which actually we body scan customers, in this case women, to try and help them find their perfect fitting jeans. So the way we do that is that you, you step into a pod which um, has a whole bunch of these Kinex sensors and uh, we have 16 of these sensors and from that we construct a full 3D model, model so millions of points and also we derive about 200 measurements. So very briefly this is the kind of process uh, that one goes through. And, and what we do is two things, we on the one hand we take your measurements and then we match those to the measurements of the gene. So this is, this is a customer getting scanned and then finding the, the genes that fit them. So I decided actually why not use the same process uh, in my case to try and track my body. So, um, so this is what happens for a woman, the, the measurements that you get and then the genes that match their body and then Here's me and a whole bunch of my measurements. And um, obviously the, the key ones that I want to focus on is obviously the waist and how I have monitored that. Um, so this is um, a module over a four month period starting in October and the waist is on the top there. So I'll slide to the, the, the final result, which is um, just in January, just a few days ago. And you can see, <coughs> a bit of a decrease in, in the waist size as a normal graph, but perhaps more importantly when you look at these sort of factors, you can sort of overlay you, but also we can do fun things like that you can't do normally, it's to sort of slice you in the middle, which, which you can't do you know, for a normal human being, and overlay you. So, um, and so finally, um, I'm going to get around to doing my gene test to see whether I do have this mutation and uh, hopefully continue tracking my body uh, like I've done in this case. Thank you. Great, do we have questions for Sran? We have about how much time do we have for questions? Seven and a half? Okay. Yes, Raj. So just a couple of basic, sorry, basic questions. What did you do to try to change your waist size, and secondly, what did you learn from this uh, experience over the course of this uh, month or two? So, uh, it was a period of four months, and it was very simple. I just uh, went swimming three times a week, and had a different uh, diet, which was really sort of, you know, raw food, you know, less junk food, and uh, so no weights, nothing like that, but simply three times a week swimming and better diet. And what did you learn? that I should continue to do it. Do it. <laughs> that's, the, that's the thing I learned. Roger, I don't know if you can answer this one, but um, the, the gene mutation, does it mean that you're seven times more likely to have a heart attack or survive, or not survive it? Um, I think, um, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it was actually mortality, so I think it was actually death. Gail. And, and so in terms of that gene, um, what is it, uh, well, what's the causal mechanism of the heart attack? In other words, is, is it um, like a, a muscle abnormality, a nerve abnormality? Is there, can you track it to a, um, a biochemical imbalance? I have no idea. So if we're not a woman who wants to buy jeans at Bloomingdale's, where can we get ourselves measured by a body matrix device? <laughs> so I think if you, uh, if you go and speak nicely to the person who runs the body metrics department in the women's jeans area, I'm sure they'll let you. If Diva shows tomorrow, will that work? And, it, and it's free, so uh, as I said, it's not really intended for that purpose, but you're welcome to use it. <laughs> Karen. So once you do your 23andMe panel, and what 
will that affect, how will that affect actually your tracking of your yourself and your diet, and assuming when you continue, when you stop, once you know whether or not you've got the gene? I'm gonna get a body transplant. <laughs> <laughs> no idea either. So uh, I, I think it's just one of those things. I think uh, so. That's one of the past reasons why why I haven't taken it because it was one of those things. Perhaps I don't exactly want to know that if I have that gene. So I might as well do the best I can by you know trying to minimize all the other factors uh, because I'm sure there's a lot of people who live with that gene and it's only a probability anyway. So I think I think that'll be my assessment if I can. Um, you know, reduce all the other risk factors, at least just keep that one gene factor if, if it does exist. Uh, that's my view, I guess. Have you thought about putting a scale in the body metrics uh, unit and then selling it to every university and hospital in the country? We, we haven't, well, we, we've thought about it, but we haven't, uh, there isn't a scale at the moment in it. Uh, but we, it's crossed our mind that maybe we should put like a, because I said it's not really designed for that purpose, but uh, I think we can sort of perhaps put a scale and maybe some sort of basic body fat monitor. I mean, I don't know how accurate these things are. I said, uh, you know, you guys know a lot more than I do about this stuff. Uh, but yeah, that, that might be one of the things, and it's easily doable. I was just gonna add, you know, I think the beginning of your uh, presentation, you talked about BMI and how inaccurate it was. And your, your uh, machine seems like it can be pretty accurate on your body dimensions, that might be something uh, of interest where you could actually do your body dimensions and get a more accurate uh, a measurement of BMI. Uh, the scales to uh, body fat, I, I guess that's the term I was thinking of, is body fat percentage, that your uh, equipment might be able to do that if you do the weight, you can come up with what your main body mass was. Right, so I think, um, again, you know, we haven't done any, any work in that area at all, but I think there's something to do with um, sort of mass and, uh, and tracking mass. Uh, because, uh, and that's even from a sort of visual, sort of fashion point of view, you know, it's what you see, if you like. So, uh, because nobody's really putting scale underneath you and saying, you know, you reduce your scale, but what we see visually, and I think this is what we can do with, with these sort of, full surface body scanners and, and which are said I mean this wasn't possible to do I mean this wasn't this, this business wasn't possible I mean we've been operating for a while in London but it wasn't possible to scale this business until frankly like last year when these devices the hardware costs plummeted uh, and before that these things were you know costing a couple hundred thousand dollars each for all of these parts so suddenly um, we developed the first uh, body scanner using this sort of devices and now suddenly um, you, you can see uh, lots of applications that perhaps we hadn't thought about or that perhaps the, it wasn't our main area of focus. Mm -hmm. Very yes, Jackie. So I, I wonder if you can use infrared camera. So that would give you a very precise uh, shape of human body. Sorry, using what? Infrared camera. Infrared? Yeah. Um, I don't know much about infrared, so in that, apart from the, the Kinect, uh, in this case the prime sense, the uh, actual sensor, what it does is that it, it projects an infrared um, light and then it, it, uh, it projects an infrared pattern, if you like, and then it's you know, reading from that, uh, that's how it's reconstructing its 3D map. But I always thought that infrared probably wasn't sufficiently granular enough uh, to do sort of contours, but that's my understanding of it. Um, you know, uh, maybe there's some sort of newer, higher definition infrared that I do not know of, but that's my sort of understanding of infrared. Uh, but, but maybe you have a new infrared that you can talk right, about right. later. Any final questions? Yes. Body metric does have a basic measurement as well, right? So sure. do you know how it calculates that basic measurement? What are the different points it takes and how right. it calculates? Yeah, so essentially, uh, so, we, so we've been working on this for you know over 10 years, and um, so the process that it, the data goes through is that we have 16 devices uh, first, uh, which are Kinect-like devices, and from that we, we fuse that data to have millions of data points. Uh, then from that we create a 
a 3D point cloud. And after that, we use a bunch of heuristics uh, which to find out what are the uh, body landmarks, if you like. And from that, those landmarks, we run these virtual tape measures to, to derive uh, the actual measurements. So in the case of the waist, there are different landmarks depending on whether you're a man or a woman, for example. So, so but it's, it's using a sort of mission vision process to, uh, to derive, to locate those landmarks, and from that, to run a, a virtual tape measure. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you.